Our scripture this morning comes from Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35, and it's the parable of the unmerciful servant. And bear with me, since it's a little windy today, so i got to shift things around here. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought before him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. As the servant fell on his knees before him, be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him canceled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In his anger, in anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So have you ever been so mad at someone that you felt like you could never forgive them? Thank you for being honest, Ronnie. When I was a freshman in college, I attended a small school in West Virginia. It was called Davis and Elkins College. And I was able to bring my car to campus with me. Since it was such a small school, only about 500 people were staying on campus. And so that's something that you may not, you may know, that's not always an option for you if you're a freshman. A lot of times you're not allowed to bring a car on campus. Now I had the greatest car in the world, in my opinion. It was a 1985 Ford Crown Victoria. And it was a really nice car when it was made in 1985. But by 2002, it was probably a little bit past its prime. I had saved all the money that I could get my hands on when I was 17. And my parents were nice enough that they agreed to pay for half of the price of a car as well. And so I was able to purchase that car for the grand sum of $500. And now I want you to think about your first car as well and the joy that hopefully it brought to you and how much you loved having it. And the feeling of freedom that comes along when you get that first vehicle. And I want you to keep that in mind as I tell you this story. So as I said, I was a college student and I was actually at that school on a tennis scholarship is how I ended up there. And on the tennis team with me were three young men from Kenya. And they thought that that car was also the greatest car that they had ever seen. And there was one guy, uh, his name was Nahashan, I won't give you his last name, but Nahashan loved that car and he begged me all the time to let him drive it. Constantly, hey Eric, can I borrow your car? Hey Eric, can I borrow your car? And this was by far my most treasured possession and there was no way I was gonna let Nahashan borrow my car. But Nahashan was very persistent, always, always asking, hey, let me just drive it a little bit. Let me take it around the block. And so finally he came to me and said, hey, I really need to go to Walmart. Can I please borrow your car? And at this point, I even got to know him pretty well. So I said, okay, go ahead. You can take it to Walmart. And yes, even in the middle of nowhere, West Virginia, there is a Walmart. And so he made it to the store with no problem. And I happened to be standing in the parking lot of our dormitory when he pulled back into the dorms. And he pulled the car in and parked it and he parked it next to a light bulb. But he had pulled it in a little bit too far. 
And so he decided, boy, I better back this up a little bit. And as he backed up the car, he proceeded to hit the front end of the car off of the light pole and ultimately rip the front bumper off of the car. Now, imagine how it would have felt if you saw someone do that to your first car. And he didn't see me in the parking lot, but I had witnessed the whole thing. He was sitting in the car, and I could see that he was thinking, how am I going to tell Eric that I just wrecked his car? I calmly walked over to the car, knocked on the window, and asked him to get out and give me my keys. He began to apologize for the accident. I cut him short and I told him, the best thing you can do right now is to get out of my sight. And I was absolutely crushed that my fantastic 85 Crown Victoria had to be damaged like that. And in such a funny way, really. Later the next day, we had tennis practice together and Nahashin again tried to come over and apologize and, let, and, and say, oh, I'm so sorry that happened. And again that day, I let him know, I don't want to talk to you right now. And after a few more days, I had finally calmed down enough that I could talk to him about it. And I asked him an important question that I had considered, but I hadn't considered before I let him drive the car. And I said, hey, Nashin, do you have a driver's license? And his answer was, no, I don't have a driver's license. Now, when I heard that, my heart and my anger actually began to melt. Because you see, I should have asked him that question in the first place. Should have never let him get anywhere near my car knowing that he didn't have a driver's license. But I didn't think about it until it was too late. And I could have continued to, uh, withholding my forgiveness for him, but in the end I realized it's only gonna put a strain on this relationship with my teammate, someone that I'm forced to see almost every day someone that I'm forced to ride in a small van together for long hours at a time to go to the next school to play our matches. So someone that I couldn't escape. And I think that's something that we need to do. We have to be mindful that in any situation, our anger might not be as well placed as we think it is. We might not have the whole story and we might, and what we think we know might not be the truth. And it can be easy for us to forgive someone when we realize that maybe we are at fault too. But it is a much harder thing to offer forgiveness to someone when we know that they have wronged us. And I think we should think about forgiveness like this. When we withhold our forgiveness from someone, it's like having a splinter. And instead of removing that splinter, we keep pushing it deeper and deeper into our skin until ultimately it festers and becomes a problem that we can no longer ignore. So in 2006, there was a man and he went into an Amish school in Nickel Mines, PA. And you may remember this happening. And while he was in that school, he shot and killed 10 little Amish girls and then himself. And in his suicide note, he left the suicide note he left, he talked about how he was upset with God for the loss of his daughter that had she had passed away 10 years earlier. And he allowed that loss of his daughter to fester inside of himself for those 10 years. But the story doesn't end there. Within a day of the shooting, the Amish community had reached out to this man's wife and his mother to comfort them in the midst of their pain. They reached out to tell them that they were already forgiven, and that the Amish had already forgiven the shooter himself. They said things like, the man is now before a just God, what more does my anger have to do with it? And when the day of the funeral arrived for that shooter, there were more Amish in attendance than there were non-Amish. What a lesson for us, and what it means to offer forgiveness to someone, especially when we know that they wronged us. And I have to be honest with all of you. I know that I would struggle with offering forgiveness to someone if they hurt my children. And I know for certain that
that I would not be able to offer forgiveness to them the next day. But this truly stands as what it means to forgive someone, to remove that splinter before it ever has that chance to cause more damage. And when we look at our lesson today, the parable of the unmerciful servant, Jesus really lays out a clear message for us. You know, there are times when we read parables and it can be difficult for us to understand. This one's pretty clear cut, I think. We need to be willing to forgive others just as God is willing to forgive us. You see, the servant had a debt to the king and he was never going to be able to pay it back. The sum was so large he could have toiled for the rest of his life and he would have never got close to paying it off. The king calls him forward to pay the debt and the servant begs, please, please, I'll get you the money. Please, give me more time. But the king not only says, okay, I'll give you more time, he says, you are forgiven. I forgive your debt. And this is exactly what God does with us. We owe a debt for our sins that we could never hope to repay on our own. But God shows mercy on us, and if we ask for the forgiveness of our sins, he grants it. However, we have to be careful that we don't follow that pattern of the unmerciful servant. After he is forgiven, he goes out and finds another servant who owes him a much, much smaller debt. And he attacks the man. He grabs him by the throat. And he has him thrown into prison. He offers no forgiveness like the, one, like the forgiveness the king had showed him. The result is that once the king hears about this, he calls that man back to him, berates him for his lack of forgiveness. After all, that king had been, able, had been kind enough to forgive his debt. And then the man cast another servant to be tortured in prison. So the king says, since you're unwilling to forgive, I am unwilling to forgive. And has that man thrown into jail and tortured until his debts can be paid. So brothers and sisters, I believe the message is clear here. We're offered forgiveness for the wrongs that we do. And we need to be willing to offer forgiveness to others as well. Knowing that the amount of the debt or wrongs that they have done for us and are asking for us to forgive of them is nothing compared to the debts that the Lord has already forgiven for us. If we choose to withhold that forgiveness for someone, the result is that we will answer for that before our king. And too often I have seen people treat forgiveness of others like it's a yo-yo on a string. One day forgiveness is offered, and the next time they're right back to holding that same grudge that they had in the past. And I urge you that when you offer forgiveness, offer your forgiveness completely. That you move on from that and move forward. The forgiveness that we are giving through Jesus is not like a yo-yo. It's not offered and taken away, offered and taken away. It's offered to us and it's complete. And this is how the Lord wants us to forgive others as well. Too often I hear someone bring up past transgressions when they're having an argument with someone. But once you've truly forgiven someone, that's the end of it. And if we continue to berate that, berate that person about that mistake, you have not given them forgiveness. And I don't think we, we would like it if God did the same thing to us. Well, you know, Eric, I know you prayed for forgiveness about losing your temper, and I do forgive you. But, you know, I didn't like it when you lost your temper the other day. And in fact, I think you should continue to have that mark against you forever. See, if we're following what God wants us to do, then we forgive and we move on. And now I, want, and now I know that it can be difficult to forgive at times, but I want to remind you that as Christians, we are to hold ourselves to higher standards. You see, the world will tell you that you should hold on to your grudge, that you should continue to grind that ax, that you should never forget what people have done. But Jesus Christ wants us to be a people that are slow to anger and quick to forgiveness. So my challenges for you this week are, do you need to offer forgiveness? Do you need to seek forgiveness? And do you need to ask the Lord for forgiveness? And if you need to do any of these things, I urge you to do them as soon as you can. Do not wait so that you don't run the risk of having to stand before the King of Kings and explain to him why you didn't give the same forgiveness that you have been given. Amen.